Uh, hello, hello, hello. Or not, maybe. <laughs> uh, welcome to uh, Office Hours for March 3rd, um, 2024. It's March already. Well, February went by fast, even though there was an additional day. But, uh, you know, year just keeps going. You're the dragon. Welcome. Happy New Year, everybody. Sup, Mark? Good to see you, Bretron. Um, so Office Hours is a, you know, brought to you by Pure KNF Foundation. One hour where you can ask any questions about Korean natural farming. And or if there's no questions, I will just go on and tell you more in detail depth about natural farming, Korean natural farming specifically, and other topics. So before we get into what we're doing today, get a little bit of higher wisdom here and uh, see what's going on. So today, um, today is the arousing or shock. It's thunder over thunder. And it says the shock of unsettling events brings fear and trembling. Move toward a higher truth and all will be well. The tendency of human beings is to rely on strategies of the ego. Desiring, plotting, and striving. When we exercise the ego, our spiritual development stops. And the universe, universe must use shocking events to move us back onto the path. The appearance of this hexagram Chen indicates the immediate need for self-examination, self-correction, and redevotion to following the path of the sage. In Chinese, the hexagram translates to mean thunder over thunder. A continuing series of shocks occurs until the obstruction in our attitude is removed. It is important not to react against these shocks, but instead quiet and open your mind and accept what is happening has come to teach you a specific and necessary lesson. Look inside to see where you are resisting the will of the higher power. The sooner you return to innocence and acceptance, the sooner the shocks will subside. Those who maintain a reverence for proper principles and an inner commitment to higher things are unperturbed by shocking events. They simply concentrate on deepening their understanding. If you find yourself feeling threatened by the circumstances, withdraw into stillness and meditation. The only remedy for doubt and fear is a reconnection with higher truth. Shock is an important and beneficial teacher to those who follow the path of the sage. Make good use of the new beginnings and good fortune results. So yeah, shocking beginning, starting over. But yet, the continuity of the Majaj. So this year, 2024, started it off going through the Orange Book, going through Young Sang Cho, his things, you know, part of the Korean natural farming repertoire. Got into the history, showing where it came from. You can check out past episodes, KNF, uh, purekf.org. Go down to the KNF support, check out the office hours there, all the past episodes. And what's up, family? We got uh, Stone Mason in the house, Indiana. Got Cecily coming in. Oh, if I scoot around. It uh, knocks my camera out, apparently. But I did fix that buzzing noise. I figured out what the buzzing noise was. It was this little, um, was this radio antenna that was hooked into the same USB port that was causing the buzzing on my end. Um, you know, when you put too many EMFs right around you, especially in the, you know, 915 megahertz band, I'm microwaving myself just ever so subtly. Um, we got uh, Mark. What's up, Mark? How you, man? Could have used could have used your help this week, man. Putting in some hydroelectric pipes. We've been we've been slamming down at the jungle. 
uh, walk it, probably walked up and down the valley 40 times this past week, 200 feet down, sliding. It's been raining like heck, slip and slide and rappelling down cliffs, lowering down pieces of pipe that weigh, you know, hundreds of pounds. But luckily I was trained really well, uh, you know, thanks to the United States military and uh, able to belay things and run ropes and do all these things and got a great Alaskan helping me um, suit uh, a true mountain man um, and uh, we're doing we're doing well but um, yeah and good to see you too Cecily hopefully we can make it all to the monthly meeting which is coming up I think March 12th Pure Canada Foundation having their first monthly membership meeting um, and so got that going on. Let's see. I got, I got a few pictures here. Let's see what I got here. Working down at the hydro. Well, obligatory dog photo. Is it, it's catching glare. Obligatory dog photo one. And, uh, dog photo two. I don't know. Can you see the dog? It's catching the glare right on there. Oh, it's not even, it's blurred out. Can you see my dog? I don't know. There's a dog there. Um, let's see what else we got. Yeah, here's a picture of me. Uh, well, it's not me. It's just ropes on the ground. You can't even see these things. I don't know why. I should, first off, I should turn the camera sideways. And then try it. But let's see all that rope coiled. That's 250 feet of rope coiled going down a mountain. I don't know if you can see that other line right there. That one's you know, hooked to the tractor. And then eventually I get down there and manually belay this thing. But, and here's a beautiful valley. Picture of the valley with the rope in there for context. Um, you know, but we're working down in that valley. Down in that, uh, you know, putting all kinds of good stuff in there and doing it. Here's a, yeah, here's sort of a, Video is it a video? I don't know. Now my camera just yeah, there's a video. Walking along the jungle, putting that big ass pipe in there. So we can run the the office hours carbon free, right? Except for all the carbon that was used to build these pipes. Get them here, do all this, right? But this is what um, you know, I've been doing all week. Walking through this jungle, putting this pipe down there. Look at that. It's beautiful down there. Some really rich soil in certain areas. Um, really nice, but treacherous. I, you know, it's, unfortunately, it's catching glare right where you need to see it. But you know, it's office hours. This is live. I didn't, I didn't pre-plan to show you this, but look at all those nice plants down there. The jungle. It's interesting. I've been, you know, there's cub. So I've been here for, you know, um, over. Over a decade, we moved uh, to almost 20 years now, 20 years, 20 years now, at least 20 years. Um, and I've watched the jungle go through several iterations of natural plants coming in. And then, um, you know, at first there was a bunch of rose apple and then the university released a, di uh, a disease. I think, they, I believe the university released a disease and it killed off all the rose apple. And then uh, the myconia took over. Which, if you're unfamiliar with Myconia, let me see if I can pull it up over here. Myconia. Yeah, so here, let me let me get this thing, uh, that one here. Let me get that like that. So this Myconia plant took over, and uh, it has these super dark leaves. Um, let's see, there's a better picture. And it puts out hundreds and thousands of seeds. Um, and it took over. There's it. That looks like a really unhealthy one. Um, apparently there's a bunch of different varieties. Let's see. But here is, you know, the Hawaii invasive species talking about this myconia, but it, these, these leaves and they're purple on the bottom. I think those purple at least. And they let next to no life or no light through this purple bottom. And, uh, it says it grows quickly and close together, shading out nearly all other forest plants with their large oval leaves. It also has a, a shallow root system and can cause an increase erosion and landslides. And that's exactly, uh, let me make it bigger here so you can see. 
Um, but that's exactly what happened to us here was that um, it increased the amount of landslides and the whole valley shifted where it was growing um, and, you know, it matures quickly producing fruit, although I don't I've never seen fruit on it. Definitely seeds uh, several times a year. A plant produces 10 to 20 million seeds a year. Um, and so, you know, these things about the grain size of a grain of sand. And so it just spreads like wild and it took over the entire valley. Um, and so where does it say the big island, large infestations on the windward side. That's where I'm at. The smaller population on the leeward side. Um, and people try to control it, but you know, really you need to replant it with something better and take care of it and really maintain the jungle. But anyway, so, um, but interesting thing that's happened is the Myconia then its first generation grew up, shaded out the entire forest, caused huge, massive landslides and was, were big trees, <clears throat> but then they died off uh, or start, and they're starting to die off. And now the second generation of Myconia is coming up, but it's not as strong and as vigorous. So whatever um, nutrient or whatever, the, you know, it's like a monoculture disease. There's not enough IMOs down there because it kind of monocultured itself, shifted the soil biology. And now the second crop of Myconia coming up isn't as strong and the ferns are starting to come back. And some of the undergrowth like, um, Castor's curse is coming back under there, which definitely is non-native. Let me, let me look up. Um, what is it? It's, it's not chlamydia. It's, um, yeah, let me just look up Castor's curse. Um, no, plant. I don't think I'm saying it right. Oh, here it is. It's, uh, I think, uh, yeah, here we go, transition back. It's this guy. Uh, I'm not sure it's a guy, but Castor B, no, it's, it's this one here, this, uh, Clademia, uh, Clademia. This is uh, yeah, Clademia herta. Um, um, yeah, this one is coming back underneath. So these um, these are coming back. They're easier to they hold the soil a bit better, grip in there a little better. But there's here's a nice picture of it um, coming back in the undergrowth. And then also there's some wild gingers that are coming back that are non edible. I don't think. Um, and so. Um, yeah. So anyway, it's been wild going in the in the jungle doing all that. It's, but a certain place, this one place right by the waterfall, um, just really rich soil. I was treading up it yesterday. wasn't nearly as um, as um, as muddy in that area where the soil was better. Um, so it was it was cool. It's cool to get in there and do that. Um, but what else is going on? Yeah, that. Oh, and it's tiring. I'm tired right now, but it's cool. Um, so anyway, uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. Um, did I talk talk about the monthly meeting? Yeah. Anyway, um, monthly meeting coming up for Pure KNF Foundation, uh, March 12th, I reckon. Doing that. Um, getting ready for that. Getting those things. I got to get the tech set up for that. Make sure everyone gets knows how to get there that are members. Um, so more than just this YouTube, we're actually doing, you know, membership through. You can join, be an associate member, go to purknf.org. I got to put a few of those things, work on that. We got a technology committee now. So get that all formalized of how to work on the website. Make it so it's not just, uh, you know, making random edits and changes. We're actually doing things as a whole foundation and making it better for you, me, and everybody out there. But um, with that, you know, no questions. It's good. We got some nice, good regulars in the house. It's good to see you guys all um, and really appreciate you tuning in. It's amazing. I watch my YouTube subscription thing go down and down and down, you know, but this has been really con uh, consistent and um, good. So hopefully, you know, I'm not sure what shocking event I need to get it uh, going again. Maybe I need to make some YouTube videos. I need to like put some pizzazz out there. I don't know. I just I just figure people tune into what they like. It's hard to compete into. Um, like I don't want to be. Uh, what is that like? 
a slave to it, like pushing it. I want to just do what's right. So anyway, trying to do what's right every day. Um, but let's continue with uh, my dad, Jadam. Last, last week we went over the website, right? And I just want to clarify, you know, again, I, I said it like I'm not hating or anything. I was just kind of fact checking, going through, trying to tame the ego a bit, trying to find, you know, sort truth from fiction. Because Abe Lincoln once said, never trust anything you read on the Internet. Um, and, you know, so going through some of his claims was interesting that he has no reference to his dad at all. Um, but... Um, and even in this whole book, I don't think, is there a message or mention of his father at all? I don't know. I don't think so. Has anyone read this book? Does, it, does anyone know it better than I do? Um, I don't know if there's any mention of Master Cho in here. Is there? Does anyone know? Ooh, how's this one? Or wait. Devote and commit eight full hours per day to farming. So you definitely have to be a full-time farmer here. Traditional farmers went out to work when it was still dark before sunrise. They worked in the fields eating small breakfast and big lunch. They came home only after sunset and it became dark again. Farmers nowadays are also busy, but not with farming. They are busy attending meetings, tours, seminars, workshops, trainings, gatherings, parties, and other unnecessary events. The remaining time they spend on their cell phones. <laughs> if you are a farmer, devote yourself to farming at least eight hours per day. Yeah, quit your day job. Yeah, right. Um, from sunrise to 4 p.m., Oh, you only have to work from sunrise to 4 p.m. After 4 p.m., you can then uh, work your regular job that makes you real money. Um, work at least eight hours a day focusing on farming. Work hard and think innovatively. Seek improvements and develop new methods. Always experiment, study, and learn. If you're not devoted, your family may not respect you. I'm pretty sure my family respects me. Your customers will not be impressed with the products you grow. Man, he's saying like hobby people, people aren't going to be. All right. Anyway, devote and commit. That is the only way to produce the best quality and high yield. I beg to differ. I think a whole bunch of like hobby people produce great things. And in fact, I one of my main promulgations, one of my main things is I don't think everybody should be a farmer and a full-time farmer, but everyone should farm a little bit. And if everyone farmed a little bit, our whole world would be much better. I, I really don't advocate for people doing full-time farming. I mean, I do, you know, if you really love it and that's your passion, then do it. But I think everybody just does a little bit. We're going to be way better off than a few people doing a whole lot of it. Um, Anyway, so I, I strongly disagree with this. Times have changed. A company can market its produce to, or its product to markets of the world. It is now same for individual farmers. Global internet shopping malls like Amazon and Alibaba are coming into Korea. Once you start selling through those malls, your sales will soar. I I find it hard to believe that I could sell my f bananas on Amazon and that my sales would soar. I think what would happen is it would rot in the mail um, or cost me a fortune in shipping. Maybe I could do dried bananas, and I think I will once I get this hydro in, get more power. But I don't think my sales are going to soar. I, I just, I, I, <laughs> Especially if I market on Alibaba or Amazon, it's like Amazon bananas. It's like, who the heck... I don't know, maybe in some big city somewhere and maybe in Korea because it's more like cities and quicker to get things. But me shipping my bananas from Hawaii to you, I don't think my sales are going to soar. Maybe. China will become the largest organic market in the world. Hmm. So the most one of the most toxic places on earth is going to become the organic market of the world with probably the lowest standards. Maybe. Okay. 
Korea can access this market with the greatest ease and speed. Yeah, because they're right across the Yellow Sea. To change risk into opportunity, what the farmer needs to do is to secure certification of quality and low price. Uh, for me, it's been word of mouth, you know. Um, sure, you can get a certification and, uh, you know, know, know what you're doing, but um, usually it's like, that guy has the stuff, get it from him. For well-prepared farmers, the future will open up immense opportunity. So, anyway, just a little sample of this here. Um, devote and commit eight hours to farming a day. What do you think? Do you think you're going to be better off if you commit eight hours a day to farming and that your sales are going to soar from Amazon and Alibaba? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, uh, you know, maybe you do. <laughs> don't think so. I think locally produced closer things and not giving uh, Jeff Bezos Claus a cut of your sales or Jack Ma a cut of your sales is probably going to be better. Um, not that I advocate going to a farmer's market, but maybe you could make your own direct consumer sales and not going through their marketplace and having them take a cut of your valuable production. I don't know. What do you think? Um, oh, I'll read this other thing because I, 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 I agree with this heading here. Your wife plays a central role. I'll agree with that for sure. I, I don't think I could do anything of what I'm doing without my wife. Um, I mean, I could do parts of it. I've done parts of it. I've done things, but I couldn't expand to the level we are and I, I wouldn't have the support. Oh, and thanks Stone Mesa for that super chat. You awesome. All right, y'all. Thank you. The support, the support, supporting the channel, supporting the work. It's great. So I definitely couldn't do it without these, uh, my subscribers, without my dedicated fans out here, without, you know, the dedicated natural farmers around the world, because I'm trying to teach natural farming. So if you don't learn and then teach and go and spread, that's my whole mission. So also couldn't do it without you, but let's read this little bit about the wife here. If you are a husband, which I guess this is like, you know, uh, we won't get into the gender argument here, but the changes that occur, if you are the husband, the changes that are occurring is not simple. It cannot be handled by yourself alone. I'll agree with that because, man, it takes more than one person. I mean, I guess, you know, it's not like you need a wife. It could be a partner, right? doesn't matter uh, sex or gender on this. You need someone else that's as dedicated and that you have that level of commitment of a husband wife. It doesn't necessarily have to be that way, though. Um, you know, you could have a, a, a great bro on your farm that is like, you know, you just bro down and it works well. Um, you need the participation and support from your wife. Yeah. Okay. Partner. Your wife will actually be playing a central role in your farming. Of course, of course, any person you're going to be committed to, especially if you're farming eight hours a day, because think of that, how are you going to wash your laundry? How are you going to clean the dishes? How are you going to keep the house? Oh, hello. And if you're both out there working eight hours a day, it's like, you know, um, without her, you would probably have to hire a worker for 40,000 per year to do all the things she is doing. If you think your wife is only worth $40,000, you must be tripping, bro. It's like 120,000. I guess maybe this was written, I don't know, before inflation was so bad. I mean, it's always been bad, right? The Federal Reserve, you learn about the Federal Reserve. They've been stealing our money by devaluing currency since forever. That's their main goal. Um, yeah, way more than that um, per year to do all the things she's doing. Without your wife or life mate, there you go, life mate, it is impossible to break into the post-2020 era. Which is funny, he's saying this, uh, without a life mate, because divorce rates are up huge. So what that, you know, but maybe people aren't farming. Maybe they're not both on the farm. And, you know, you want to have a stable marriage, you want to have a stable life mate, maybe you should start farming. Divide and give out your wife's household chores to your children. So enslave your children, yes. Uh, and maybe not enslave, but, you know, give them duties, responsibilities, make them earn their food. Wait, is that slavery? I don't know. Um, if that is not enough, you yourself should actively help her with her chores. 
Yeah, because otherwise you're going to get a divorce. Um, your wife is your best partner. No doubt. Um, you know, whatever. Train her to be an expert in farming who can manage the farm without your help. Yeah. Because <laughs> if you break your leg or you die, uh, your wife's going to be screwed, right? Um, have, have, you know, I'm, I'm teaching my wife how to drive the tractor, how to tie knots, how to, you know, do everything. She's super capable. This whole week I've been just slamming down in the river working eight hours a day, at least more than that, like 12, 14 hours a day down there. And she's been able to feed the animals, uh, take care of most things. I, I did have to refill the cow's water the other day because it was empty, but you know, but we're working together. We're, we're really, it's, it's, it's a solid team. I wholly, wholly agree with this, that, um, life mate, life partner is essential for a successful farm because you will break down, um, one way or another being, you know, in sickness and in health, and you both need to be redundant pieces of equipment that know how to do it, do, but then do what you do to make it happen. Um, and so pesticides are probably the most expensive part of your farming. Not for me. I tell you what, I don't, I spend zero on pesticides. And so, um, it's really not that expensive. So he must be tripping here. Make your wife into a damn pesticide expert who can make natural, cheap, and effective pesticides by herself. It's like, okay, so train your wife how to inhale freaking sulfur fumes and stuff. No, 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 no. Like, I'm not going to let my wife make the sulfur, man. That's like, a, that's like a, there's, there's gender roles for a reason. That's I'm, as a man's job. I will do that for her and keep her nice and pretty and fair. And I will breathe in the gross fumes and do that. And, you know, sodium hydroxide, I mean, she can make soap, sodium hydroxide. Awesome. But I'm, that's, that's wild, man. And then it end this paragraph ends by saying she will be a treasure to your farm. And that's definitely true, man. The wife is the best treasure. Um, you know. So don't be put making your treasure make the sulfur. Come on, Jung Sung. And also, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, kids. So Cecily's saying here, you know, um, kids certification seem to be an exclusionary mechanism for sure you know maybe you want to get into that exclusive math um exclusionary market and uh, yeah pressure the other people out who don't have time and energy to get in there it can also cer certain certifications can be a, a level like a set of standards and levels that are certain you know methods knowing they're happening but it's best to know your farmer it's best to go visit your farms that you're getting your food from um either that or just realize you're eating toxins if you're not doing that if you haven't been to the farm you're eating food from you're probably eating toxins just just you just got to accept that in today's world because you know there it is in plastic it's getting heated by this heated by the sun my my scrotum is moving towards my anus you know it's just so it is right this is just, you know, modern 2024 life of plastic poisoning and everything. So, um, you know, you're never going to escape these toxins. Um, we're just breeding it. <laughs> um, but you can at least try better in your own farming and growing your personal food this way. Um, but cer certain certifications can be good, can be bad. Um, you know, the exclusionary principle I agree with. Sometimes it's good to exclude certain things. You know, um, but otherwise it's not. And kids nowadays seem to be having a free ride in some families. It's absolutely for sure. I, my neighbor's right up the way. Um, you know, I wish I would see those kids. They have, you know, 25 acres of land. And uh, I, I barely see the kids leave the house. They're addicted to the screens, the TVs, all those things. Um, you know. But what you, what you gonna do? There's fire ants out here. There's uh, semi slugs. There's, you know, and there's always been danger in the world. I think they need to go out and and do all that those things. Um, the produce I work with only comes from farmers I know. Wish more people would appreciate quality over price. And I think I think you will find people that do appreciate quality over price. It's just getting it to the right people. And, um, there, you'll always find someone that'll value quality over price. 
someone that's willing to pay for good stuff. It's just a matter of time, marketing, you know, getting it out in front of them to be like, hey, but there are always people out there because money is just a flow, um, you know, and unfortunately it's issued from a central bank that, that is like, that's a vacuum. It's a, it's a vortex sucking on that flow. Um, but you know, it's just a flow so you can find, you know, and if you're putting out good stuff, there's, you're always going to earn more money because it is a flow, even though there's that sucking vortex or anyway, you can tell I don't necessarily like the central banks and all that whole idea of, um, them vampires. Um, so farmer Cheryl is asking, do KNF pesticides work on cabbage moths? What should I apply and how? I am using a site that has lots of them, so wondering what approach to take. Um, I taught lots of people before I got certified February 22 to I'm just way better at it. Yeah. So we'll get to the cabbage moth question here in a moment. That's a good segue to get into what I was going to talk about today anyway. Um, and we'll t finish up with Mark's comment there of, so Mark did come to Canna Farm here and learn and... It's just, I take my, my, what is it? Uh, it's been doing this since 2007. Was it like 15, 16, 20, I don't know, more than, more than 15 years of doing this. And I condense it down to a week and give it to you. And if you can slurp it up as fast as you can from the fire hose, you will learn so much and level up so quick because there's nothing like learning with someone that knows what they're doing versus just learning through the internet. So I don't have any classes listed. People keep asking me. I'm, I've been like, uh, I guess I want to list classes. I guess I want to do this again. I mean, it's what I do, but I'm always like, man, I don't know if I really want to do this, but I guess I do. I'll put classes up again soon. I was thinking of doing one in July. I should really list that if I'm going to do it in July, because otherwise I'm not going to have anybody sign up and then I'm going to, that's nothing worse than teaching a class with hardly anyone there, except for it's super fun. And that person gets a huge value, but then I'm like, it's a ton of effort for me, ton of effort to go and give these great classes out. So anyway, I'm not complaining. I'm just uh, restrained, restraining myself. I should probably do that. Anyway, I will list them because people keep asking and then I'm just like, oh man, I'm so, I have so many other things I want to do in my life, but this is one of them. And the thing is when I teach you and you go out and you learn and you do it better, that brings joy to my heart and serves Master Cho, even though he's blurry, but he's right there, you know should really make him non-blurry. Um, so anyway, just trying to find the way. Yeah, we are all just trying to find the way. The way is through the lactobacillus. I'm just, I'm just stuck in the curds, man. If I, you know, why aren't we all on the way? Because we're stuck in the curds. All right, enough rambling, enough blambling, enough going. Let's get into some meat and crackers. Or just meat. Just meat. Let's be carnivorous today. Okay, so there was asking about a cabbage moth. So in the back of the Madaj book, because he talks about spending so much on pesticides, which I believe is false. If you do Korean natural farming for Master Cho and you get great soil and you have great plant fertility, most of this is irrelevant and you won't even need to do this. Why does he talk to you spend so much on pesticides? Because he doesn't understand his father's methods. And he has these other cheap ways of going about it, and they're just not as good. So he spends most of his cost on pesticides, most of his time making pesticides. Why? Because he doesn't understand the fer full fertility of his father's methods of getting these things there. So um, JS is as cheap as is JWA. Yeah, both these things are cheap, um, but you don't. But you will nuke your biology by using them. So. Anyway, let's dive in. Let's get to some cabbage moth stuff. Let's go. I'm going to go to flip to the back of the book here, because if you don't understand Master Cho and his methods, then you will have to use these. So let's go back to the back of the book and let's look up a cabbage moth one, because I'm sure he put it in here. He starts with rice bacchanae disease, goes through water rice weevil. Pest control solution for rice, powdery mildew, downy mildew, fungal diseases. We'll get into some of these. Yeah. Um, yeah. Canker, black spot, parus, bond botch, aphid and mite. Let's keep going. Moth. Here we go. Moth. 
I think this is what you're talking about. Cabbage moth, gotta be one of these. He's saying moth. Tobacco moth, beet army, worm, scale, slug moth, diamondback moth, oriental fruit moth, etc. It gotta be moth, right? This is the moth solution here. Moth. So if you have the same edition of the book that I have, I have an old one. I'm not sure. It's page 316 if you want to follow along. Let's just go, and, and before I get back to this, I, I will come back and read this recipe out. Let's just go through the rest of this, the pest he says here. Number eight is citrus flat, flatted plant hopper, leaf hopper, mulberry sucker, spot cloth waxing cicada. And he has a recipe for stink bug, thrift, greenhouse white fly, turnip moth. Oh, there's a turnip moth. This might, we'll read this one too then, because it has a moth re referenced. Flea beetle, pear sucker, fruit fly, onion fly, mosquito, grasshopper, etc. And then there's slug and snail, number 10 here. So slug and snail, because uh, Goofman was talking about that. We'll get to that one too. Then there is JMS pesticide. Um, the microbial solution for prevention of pests and disease. And then there's an all-purpose pesticide for both pests and diseases, which, again, if you're doing good soil, and good soil foundation, good plant nutrition, some of this should be uh, extraneous to you. But then there is fruit trees, winter pest control. Then there is soil foundation, um, which says it's effective against soil nematodes. Verticillium wilt, viral virus diseases, and that's it. So, oh, and there's an herbal smoker. <laughs> What's up, herbal smoker? Um, I don't think it's the herbal smoker we're thinking of, but I'll show. Well, maybe we'll get into this. Um, Yaman, yeah, we killed the disease by just smoking the herb. Um, yeah, yeah, I and I, um. Okay, well, those are those are the recipes he gives us here in the back. Um, not so much year three, killing pests, man. You know, ki yeah, uh, you know, in in killing pests, if you're doing like heavy commercial stuff and you need perfect produce, jadam. Oh yeah, that's a great one, Christoph. Jadam, man. Burn down Babylon. So we're gonna burn down cabbage moths. I you got? Can you see this? Here, I'm going to put it closer. So that's, this, this is what I'm going to read. I'm going to go over this. I'm going to bust out an herbal kit, man. I got an herbal kit behind me. And um, I, I do have the jaw down. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think that's the same kind of herbal smoker they're talking about, though. Just because you smoke herb doesn't mean the pests are going to die. <laughs> All right. Well, let's go. Let's go over this one here. Um, let's go over this. Hey, thanks, Bird. What's up? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, second super chat of the day. Oh, yeah, yeah. Making the, um, making the movement move. And the office hours stay live. Thank you, thank you. Appreciate it, appreciate it. It's a, Look at that, you're amazing. Look at that little peanut-looking thing dancing. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. All right, so... <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone who supports the show and all these things. What about tiny white flies on the tomatoes? We'll get to that one. That, those are called, um, those are called white fly. Um, is it? Yeah, greenhouse white fly, number nine. So we'll get to that. We'll go through a few of these recipes today. Um, we're going to go through seven, recipe seven here. We'll go through recipe nine and 10 at least so i can't do them all at once because then why would you tune in next week well i mean because it's a you know yeah you know you know why you tune in it's more than this so we're gonna go through recipe number seven here um in the this edition of the book this was the first edition of this orange majab book here so this one number seven is for moth and then in parentheses, it just says moth in general. And in parentheses, it says tobacco moth, beet army worm, scale, slug moth, diamondback moth, oriental fruit moth, etc. 
which I was unaware that scale was a moth, but maybe maybe it's not. Then down down in the pictures down below, just just so you know, down in the pictures here, these these pictures here. I don't know if you can see. Yeah, can you see it? Yeah. So and then I'm going to read the captions of these pictures, right? Because anytime you read a scientific book, you should read the figures first and then go back and read the chapter, right? You all went to what is that it's ninth grade? science class whatever eighth grade science class so it says uh under the pictures here the first one is right here citrus mealybug it treats which is plant planocus citri arrowhead scale which is un 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 no uh, i'm gonna try to read that a little better unaspis Yanonensis, then kills tobacco moth larvae, uh, larva, then it kills cabbage moth larva, cabbage moth larva, oh that's, you were asking about cabbage moth, oh yeah, it kills cabbage moth, it wasn't listed in the top, but it's listed down here, it killed a larva, fruit, fruit worm moth larva, so this might work for um, those things eating the um, kabocha squashes around here, perilla leaf, moth larva right there slug moth larva never heard of slug moth larva before but i'm sure i've seen that it looks like it's a spiky little thing i don't know if you can, can you see it i don't even have good lighting in here but uh that thing that's all it's a it's a spiky looking guy kills diamond back moth larva right there and diamond back moth larva again which there's two of those for some reason I'm not sure why, but there's two of those. Maybe he meant to put something else there. I'm not sure. So, so what is for killing all these moths, all these things here? What is what is the recipe? What is the thing? The um, the recipe is um, using Jadam wetting agent. So, uh, let me let me hang on one sec. Let me pull these things out behind me. So, number one, you need Jadam wedding agent. I know it's backwards and it looks like A-W-L, but it's actually J-W-A. It's because I mirror the camera for some reason. Because I don't know. I like looking at a mirrored camera versus the non-mirrored. I, I don't know. Anyway, you need soap. This is soap. You can use Dr. Bronner's. You can use Dawn soap. This is soap. It's soap concentrate. It is... Uh, sorry, I'm opening it here. It is, I don't know if you can see the suds in there. You can't, can you see the suds? I don't want to pour it on my keyboard. But yeah, this is just soap. It's, uh, he makes his own. You can make your own. Super easy to make. Um, it's, uh, you know, we'll go over the soap recipe maybe next time, something like that. So, um, so soap, it says you need uh, eight liters of it. So how much are you actually going to make? I think he's making a 500 liter batch, which is 132 gallons. So... If you're not going to make 132 gallons or 500 liters, you're going to need to scale this, right? So, um, so 500 liters, eight, you, so to make 500 liters of this, you're going to need eight liters of soap. So I'll leave the math up to you because, uh, you know, hopefully you passed high school algebra and you can do this type of math. Um, if not, Look for the updated version of the app. No, I, I haven't made an app for this, but I should. I should, I should, I should. I have the pests in here. So you need, again, to make 500 liters of water, you're going to need 8 liters of the soap. The Jadam wetting agent, also known as just soap. We talked about how egoic he was, saying that he invented this, even though Dr. Bronner invented it in the 60s, and he only invented it in the 90s, so... <clears throat> prior invention that's why it's not patented <clears throat> yeah okay but let's not let's uh let's humble ourselves let's have a new beginning here let's just pretend like um this is good and then other thing you're going to need so there's only two ingredients besides water first one is the soap the wedding agent the second one is Jeru jerusalem artichoke 
JHS, which JHS stands for Jadam Herbal Solution. Jadam Herbal Solution. Um, and you're going to need 15 liters of that. So this is again into that 500 liters of water. You're going to need 15 liters. So if you can do some algebra, you can figure out how to dose this. If you can't, uh, just wait and I'll make an app for that. Um, so let's, let's look at my kit here and find the JA one. It's not in my kit. It's not in my kit. I don't have Jerusalem Artichoke unless he used a different acronym. Hang on, let me look one more time. How would he not have this in the kit? We're just going to use PA and say it's Jerusalem Artichoke. I don't know. Anyway, you. You make these herbal solutions, I talked about it, they're in the book, how to make these herbal solutions. You basically take a whole bunch of Jerusalem artichoke. Let me pull up the book while I'm talking about it, uh, because I have it in the book here. It is, uh, it's actually in the new edition. Uh, so going down here to make these herbal pest solutions, herbal pest solutions, and we'll go swap this over there, transition that over. There you go. And this is the herbal pest solution. Um, it's terribly low cost. And you basically gather the plant. In this case, it would be Jerusalem artichoke. Fill the pot with the plant material and cover it with water. And then boil that sucker until half the water remains. And then filter out into small bottles with liquid while it's still hot and turn the bottles on their sides. And when I'm talking about small bottles, I'm talking about small bottles like this. Um, in, in your case, maybe you want to do 15 liters of this if you're going to make 500 liters, you know, because that's what it's going to take. Um, so maybe you want to get a big, uh, what is that? That's like, uh, that's like four gallons, four gallons of this. So you're going to have to get an eight gallon freaking thing and boil it to get it down to be that. Um, but then you get that Jerusalem artichoke you, and then put it in a, you know, or just dump it straight in raw, whatever. It doesn't matter. If you're going to store it, put it in small bottles and then turn them on their sides. These are just small bottles for the kit, right? So you can go test things out and do things. But once you open the bottle, it's going to rot and then it's going to explode and detonate. It happened to a few of my things where I opened them from that kit and then they detonated. But this is how you make a Jadam herbal solution right here. Take a screenshot, uh, do it, um, or, you know, uh, get the book, new edition coming out soon, I guess, um, and uh, do that. And then now you have the solution. So I'll read what he says to do. So it says, mix the above ingredients. So again, that's the soap at eight liters and the Jerusalem artichoke at 15 liters, which is four gallons. Mix the above ingredients into water, 132 gallons. If, in, if, if infestation is serious, increase the Jadam wetting agent to 10 liters. So more soap, uh, which isn't that much different, but um, yeah or apply at sunset followed by another application early next morning. You can replace J Jerusalem artichoke with pokeweed, ginkgo, Korean pasque flower root. Number seven is stronger than number six. So I didn't read number six for you, but um, to add germicidal effects, control diseases, add one to two liters of the sulfur. We didn't talk about that yet. Pesticide becomes very strong if you increase both the soap and the herbs. The herbs. You can apply repeatedly if the sulfur is not used. So if you use sulfur, just do it once. If you uh, don't use sulfur, you can do it multiple times, I guess. For hairy pests like su slug moth larva, yeah, that spiky looking guy. Thosa, Thosea sinensis. Repeatedly apply and wet them thoroughly. If you add a half kilo of very fine red clay powder, it increases the effectiveness. So the, the red clay powder kind of magnetically sticks to the things and brings and draws these 
chemicals closer to the thing. That's why he adds red clay powder. It was also in his fire ant recipe. He used uh, red clay powder. Very, very essential in that. Um, you can replace it with very fine rock powder, but the type of rock might not mix well in the pesticide. Do a mixture test prior to make sure it is safe. So this is the, you know, in general, what I just read there is his general uh, way of doing it. Um, and that's how to mix their own pesticides, like I said, um, how to do these. That's a basic recipe ratios that should mess up all those things. So if you don't have Jerusalem artichoke, you can use like Korean pasque flour. So Korean pasque flour root, I do have that one, KPFR, right? So this is in my kit. So if I don't have the Jerusalem artichoke, I got this in my kit. This is super toxic. Watch out. Um, and what else did he say? You could also uh, use ginkgo and pokeweed. Which... Here's some pokeweed. You see how this bottle is expanded? I don't know if you can see that at the bottom. But this is because I opened it and I closed it. But this is the pokeweed here. PW, pokeweed. And GF, the ginkgo flower, I think, is it? What is it? Ginkgo? I believe this is ginkgo. GF. I, I don't know. Maybe it's something else. I should. I, I, I don't know. But GF. Um. Yeah, so having a kit, having all these herbs ready to go, knowing when to use, what to use, how to use it, um, very essential. So again, you mix these things up. Uh, it doesn't talk about the amount you need to spray, believe it or not, here. Um, so I guess just soak it down. Just soak it down, like Aaron Brown. <laughs> uh -huh, yeah, um, so yeah, just soak it down. Put it on there. Uh, if you have a foam gun, uh, he does talk about it in the very back here about a foam gun. The more you can foam it and get it directly on those pests, spray them, it should um, take them to heaven or hell, depending on how you believe in things. Or, you know, maybe they'll reincarnate. Um, or, you know, maybe, uh, maybe they just get absorbed into the matrix and become food for the next generation, which is probably more correct. But that's how you mess up these things. Just soak it down. Make sure you get it all over the leaves. Get it all over the pest. And make sure you do a test to make sure you're not going to burn your plants before you put it on, right? And you can lower or raise the dilutions to get it to be effective. It's best if you take some of those pests, like I said, put them in a Petri dish. Spray this directly on them. Spritz it on them. Make sure they die. Because otherwise you're going to go out there and spray your whole field and maybe it wasn't even effective. So get some of the pests. Bring them in. Spray them in a small petri dish. Find your effective dose. Go spray what you thought was your your minimum effective dose on some of your plants. Make sure it doesn't burn your plants. Then go out and do the rest. Right. Um, how long do you have to wait after applying the solution to harvest the leaves? Do you have to wait days, weeks? Um, I don't know. I don't know. It's in this book somewhere. Um, you know, they'll tell you it's all you got to go then get a chemical analysis. That's why I don't use these pesticides. They're 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 like you're you're putting poison on it to kill something and then you're going to eat it. It's like, OK, um, sure. Why not just eat the one with the bugs on it? I don't, I don't know. Anyway, but I do I do want to answer your question properly. How long do you have to wait? Um, the soap, the soap itself breaks down in three days, three days. You should have a 98% of it should be gone. Uh, just so it breaks down really fast. The soap is gone in three days. The herbs, how fast did they break down? Um, I would say a week is probably good. I don't, uh, I don't know. You'd have to try to see. It depends on what herb you're going to use, right? Uh, if you're going to use, um, you know, pokeweed might be different than ginkgo might be different than Korean pasque flower root is different than maybe um, the Jerusalem artichoke, but I would assume it's in, ask you me, um, that about a week, uh, it should be pretty much broken down two weeks for sure, uh, would probably be absolutely safe. 
Um, and these things, however, you know, every time they're doing the Jadam lecture, he'll, he'll like spray it in Rayun's mouth. And like the whole idea is that these are edible pesticides. It'll kill the bugs, but it won't kill you. So I don't think you have to worry about human toxicity. Maybe the Korean pasque flower root, you do have to worry about human toxicity. You know, there are gnarlier herbs than others. And you want to be very smart on this. And, um, it, you know, try to spray it before, knock your pest back before you're near your harvest, right? Um, you don't want to just spray it on and then harvest it. I, I cannot definitively answer you because there are too many variables here. And I'm not sure how fast it rains where you're at and what's happening and how things are going and your harvest procedures and do you wash it after you harvest it? I have no idea. So, um, so I, um, anyway, if, with that, uh, small amount of tests, um, you know, feed it to your neighbor that you're not so keen on. If they don't die, then assume maybe it's safe. Either that or they are very robust and, or I'm not advocating for any, uh, you know, just take that as a joke. Um, so days, weeks, I would say, you know, the longer you wait, the better, because these things are going to break down quicker. So, um, so with that, um, I did want to get to these other two recipes here. Um, let's just go through here because, and I will just give you the very, very basics of these because we only got a few more minutes. So if you're dealing with, um, if you are dealing with the white flies here, white flies, greenhouse white flies, I, you know, maybe I should take more time for this. I don't know. We'll go into a little bit of overtime, overtime for you. So I got a few more minutes here. So we'll see. Um, can I can I suggest a ways to remove, digest non-ionic surfactants from the soil from pre-emergent applications? Microorganisms. Um, they're going to break down the vast majority of everything. Um, so go make good IMO, make a liquid IMO tea, put that out there. Hopefully that'll break things down. Um, but the best way to do it is to not spray those things in the first place. Um, but if you have it, the microbes, they might do their work. So getting on to stink bugs, thrips, greenhouse whitefly, turnip moth, flea beetle, pear sucker, fruit fly, onion fly, mosquito, grasshopper, etc. Um, and this one also deals with bean bugs, silver white fly, turnip moth larva, pear psilia, greenhouse white fly, tangerine thrips, winter cherry bugs, mosquitoes, and fruit flies. All those things that we hate, right? Kill them all. Actually, they're, they're part of nature and you probably just need to balance it. Um, but anyway, if you do want to kill everything, because that's, you know, it's definitely the American way. Um... You can go by mixing 10 liters of Jadam wetting agent, the soap. It's just soap. I don't, I'm not going to call it JWA. It's like he didn't invent it. Dr. Bronner's. We'll just call it Dr. 10 liters of Dr. Bronner's. It's just soap. Okay. Uh, it's liquid soap. Um, then 15 liters of the Korean pasque flower root. So I've already mentioned that one prior, right? You, I know it's blurry. You can't see it. I got this like portrait mode thing going on um so into again 132 gallons because that's all his things are 500 liter things i don't know why who the heck makes 500 liters it's like you i mean i guess if you're a serious farmer and you're doing it eight hours a day 500 liters probably makes sense for you uh, but then if you're talking about making your wife do this like how the hell is my wife going to lift 132 gallons ain't gonna happen um Maybe with, she, she's getting better at driving the tractor. Maybe that's how. Um, so mix those above ingredients. Okay, so again, for, for all these things that I just mentioned, uh, you know, you can go back. Uh, 10 liters of soap, 15 liters of the Korean pass flower or herbal solution, and then f into 500 liters of water. This is the strongest of all Jadam pesticides. Korean pass flower root can control almost all insects. If serious, increase the, the soap up to 15 liters and the Korean pass flower root solution to 20 liters. So again, you kind of got a scale here. You can increase it. If sulfur is not used, you can apply this twice a day 
or between one to two days. Number nine, which is this is number nine, includes the effect of all number six, seven, and eight. This can be used to kill pests in the soil, reduce the volume of ingredients by half. So if you're killing them in the soil, make it half that. Uh, to add germicidal effect and control disease, add one to two liters of the sulfur. Pesticide becomes very strong if you increase both the soap and the herbal solution. Do not repeatedly use at strong concentrations of the soap being over 10 liters. It can damage white powder on some fruits and cause growth problems. So here's talking about overdosing. Be super careful. You can apply repeatedly if the sulfur is not used. If you add a half kilo a very fine red clay powder, it increases the effectiveness. You can replace it with a very fine rock powder, but the type of rock may not mix well with the pesticide. Do a mixture test prior to make sure it is safe. So basically this is the, the dynamite of all the recipes. You wanna go with the weaker stuff first, but if you can't kill things with that, then go with this one here um, and kill it all. Um, or, you know, or just improve your soil health and your plant fertility, you know, your, your, your plant, uh, you know, and maybe you won't have these problems. Um, but if not, nuke them with this. This is the, uh, the Jadam, right? Which is kind of funny because Jadam, isn't it, isn't it, uh, isn't the Jadam like the, the mother of all bombs or Moab or, I don't know, Jadam, Jadam is like a bunker buster bomb, right? So it's kind of funny. It's called Jadam. Um, but this one with the Korean past flower and I, and obviously if you go back and listen to this, maybe you will find that I included these different things of how to mix them up differently. Um, but you will kill stink bugs, thrips, greenhouse, white fly, turnip moth, flea beetle, pear sucker, fruit, fruit fly, onion, mosquito, grasshopper, all these things. Dead. Um, how much to spray? Again, you just soak it down. Just make sure you're soaking it. Make sure you're getting it where the pests are. You can't just spray it where they're not. You really got to go in there and get it exactly where they are. Um, I don't know. It doesn't say how much per acre to spray. I mean, I'm not reading the whole book, obviously. You know, you, you got it. There's a whole book ahead of this. I'm just reading the very back and giving you kind of these recipes. I'm sure it lists it somewhere in there. Maybe we'll get to that. Maybe not. It's kind of fun to cover this stuff. And the last one I want to give you is for the slug and snail for today. We'll go a little bonus. little bonus. I, I've been watching a lot of John Levi, if you can't tell. Um, and there's a new John Levi today. It comes out Sunday, every Sunday, just like the office hours. Wow. Um, so the last one here, number 10, number 10 is slug and snail. So this one is three liters of the soap and then 1.5 kilos of sodium hydroxide, which is caustic soda, which be super careful mixing this um, caustic soda in water because it's going to heat up. Although you're only mixing 1.5 kilos into 500 liters of water. So again, all these recipes are for 500 liters. So three liters of soap, one and a half kilos of caustic soda or sodium hydroxide. Um, and it says dissolve caustic soda in a small quantity of water first. And be careful, it's gonna get really hot. Wear freaking PPE, eye protection, gloves, don't let this stuff get on your skin. It will burn holes in you. If you've ever seen Fight Club, where he kisses his hand and puts this on him, it's like, it'll burn you. It's super gnarly. Be super careful. Um, and, you know, do, don't even do this at home. I'm not advising you to do this. Um, you know, be, be warned. All those, all those usual disclaimers, don't do this. But here's the recipe. Um, Mix the above quantity of soap and water to make 500 liters. If you add an herbal solution, it can control aphids, mites, and moths. Make sure it does not touch the skin when spraying. Yes, because this stuff is caustic soda, so don't get it on you. Be super careful. Do a concentration test in prior. Nice spelling error there. Translation error. To add germicidal effects, control diseases, add one to two liters of the sulfur. You can increase the soap and add the herbal solution to achieve pesticidal and germicidal effects. 
If you add a half kilo of very fine red clay powder, it increases the effectiveness. So maybe you're seeing a trend here um, of all these recipes. They're all kind of similar. Uh, you can replace it with a very fine rock powder, but I guess, you know, you know what I'm going to say next is the type of rock might not mix well with the pesticide, right? Because I said that about the same with every single one of these. They're all very basic, very similar. Just throw some dirt in there, make sure it's super fine. Do a mixture test prior to make sure it's safe. Caustic soda can be mixed to strengthen pesticidal effect, but be very, very careful. And it says very, very twice. So be very, 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 very careful. Never to contact the skin. Do a concentration test in this case too, right? So the pest you can control, it says slugs and snails. You can control Acousta despecta, slug, winged mite, tobacco aphid, hay harista atriplicus, swallow aphid, aphis farinosa, azalea white mite, velvet mite, aphid, which is Uroleucontora g cola. So all these in this picture here, you can control all these things and mess them up with adding caustic soda in there, but be extremely careful. I did not tell you to do this. Yeah, you know, I just, it's just a recipe out there. Uh, don't do it yourself. Okay. So again, don't do this. Just, you know, be super clear. Don't ever do any of this. Don't ever do any of this. But now you know, and if you want to do it yourself, uh, yeah, whatever. I didn't tell you to do it. Um, so anyway, it's kind of fun going through Madage, going through this. I hope you're enjoying office hours doing these things. Um, yeah, so be careful. Don't ever eat any of these things. Um, even though I've seen it being done, uh, don't ever eat any of it. Don't ever sell any of this produce. Uh, but make sure you farm eight hours a day, apparently, and you have a good wife. <laughs> <laughs> and for all the ladies out there, I would assume that translates over to having a good husband. You must also teach your husband how to do this. And for all the people that are into the, you know, same sex stuff, make sure whatever gender you want to pick for your, uh, your friends, make sure that they're safe to do it. So, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you didn't hear it here. Don't tell your friends about the office hours. Don't like or subscribe and see you next week. <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Okay. Well, <clears throat> anyway, it's raining again, and I'm about to strap on my uh, my jungle boots, go down to the river, have a great time. I hope whatever you're doing this week is amazing. Enjoy March. Um, what what is it? Uh, March fourth tomorrow. March fourth. Well, uh, and then. Uh, may the 5th be with you. It's coming up soon. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Nate. Good to see you. Thanks to everybody for tuning in, especially, you know, the members. We got uh, Cecily out here. We got, uh, you know, Stonemason. We got Bird. We got all these things on here. You know, um, you didn't hear it here. Don't tell people about this. Keep it secret. Keep it safe. Uh, make sure my my sub new subscribers goes down to zero. <laughs> Oh, we'll see if the reverse technology works. We'll see. I don't know. It doesn't, you know, whatever. I do this for you. If you're here, this was just for you. Don't share it. <laughs> All right. Anyway, love you. Thank you. I'm going to get out of here before I keep making jokes about this. Um, and again, I'm just going to cut out. I'm going to make sure it's on this thing first, because sometimes I try and cut out and then I get to the other one. All right. Ready? I'm gone. See ya. Peace. Love. Uh, long live the natural farmer. Aloha. Bye.